Welcome to the Russell Hatch Show. We have Tier 1, Wendell, Season 40, in the house. What's up, man? How's it going, brother? I think you're Tier 1, Wendell. I'll, take, sure. I'll take any tier, man. I'm just happy to be uh, right in the game, you know? All right, man. Well, we were going to talk Survivor. I had a whole list here ready to talk Survivor. I'm sure you're sick of talking the same, saying the same old thing over and over. But... Recently, I watched this. First of all, I've seen a picture. I'm going to go ahead and break it down for the viewers and the listeners. I've seen a picture of a white police officer with his knee on the neck of a black man. And then it was next to Colin Kaepernick kneeing. And it said, this is because of this or something like that. And then I posted that because I was like, man. I didn't know the whole story. I just posted it. I had my little comment in my on my facebook my own little personal view on the matter and i posted it then got to busy with my list that i was going to talk to you about then i was like wait a second let, let me watch this video that everybody's talking about so i watched the video and it is dude i could hardly watch it it is disgusting yeah and it affected me to where I'm like, man, I can't even focus right now. I got, I want to talk about this. I want to talk about what's happening in this country and what we're seeing, not only physical, verbally, you know, everything. So I'm a, I'm a, I wanted to talk to you like man to man here personally as a white man in America. So I've always was against Colin Kaepernick, me and all, Neil and always. This is what I said. And it's funny because I'm reading comments and this is, I'm going to read someone else's comment, but this is my comment. I have no problem with the protest, but what I do have a problem with is this disrespect to our country and our national anthem. That's what that's, you can say, Oh, that's a Russell Hans comment. Somebody put that in my, in my message. And it isn't about the country and the national anthem. It isn't about that. Me as a white guy, when I go out, okay, when, when we go out, guys, we probably have more white people watching this than we do anything, probably 80%. So I want you guys to really think about it, really think what I'm saying here, not just go in one ear and out the other. So when you're sitting on your front porch with your people, uh, have you ever had an officer slow row by your house, you know? When you're in an elevator, have you ever seen in the corner of your eye someone clench their purse or something like that? You know, we, I've never seen it. It never happened. That never happened to me. So my perspective of Colin Kaepernick kneeling is from my, as a white man's perspective. So I can easily say, hey, the country, you need to respect this country because it, none of that stuff ever happens to me. So I can't judge on, on, it's hard for me to comprehend it. Now I've been delusional all this time because I literally woke up today after I seen that video and said, man, I'm seeing it now. I'm seeing it from both perspectives. If you guys look at it from a black, the black community's perspective, and then you see these people on, on videotape hollering like you're being attacked when she's not, clearly not being attacked, and even raising her voice to make it more urgent. You're only seeing 90% of what's really happening. Like, you, I, I mean... I'm sorry, you're probably only seeing about 4% on video. This happens 95% of the time that's not videoed. Can you imagine, Wendell, can you imagine how many people have been convicted or even put to death that were innocent, that were in the black community? So, you know, it, it, to me, I wanted to talk about this because it really affected me when I watched the video. And now I'm like, man, I understand why he kneeled. You guys have to understand why he would do something, why he would kneel. He's not disrespecting the country. He's trying to prove a point. And his point being that America needs a change. And I'm not talking about Democrats or Republican here. 
because it, it's, it was like this years back with Republicans in office and with Democrats in my office. I'm talking about that we need to change as, as people. And perception isn't always right. You perceive things to be a certain way because of their race or color. It's not always like that. So I wanted to just break that down, talk about that a little while. I want your percep- perception on it. Okay. First and foremost, Russell, thank you for inviting me on the show. Um, I've been a big fan of yours forever. Um, thank you. And secondly, thank you for allowing yourself to take in new information and change your perspective. Um, sometimes it's hard for people to do that. It's, it's how we're raised or it's how, you know, it's your environment. It's the people around you. It's the external pressures. But I think intellectual people should be able to learn new things and change their perspectives. Um, regarding what happened uh, th- this last week, first you have, um, you have George Floyd in Minnesota. He's the guy who the officer was kneeling on his neck for nine minutes and killed him. Thank God for cell phones because like you said, there's, this might be 4%. This might be a whole lot less than 4% of the things that right. actually, I could give you a list of things. I grew up in Lower Marion Township. It's a very nice uh, area. And I've been pulled over in my parents in my parents' driveway before. I've been pulled over in my friend's driveway before. Like the amount of negative interactions that I've had with police had, has led me to have my own viewpoint of police. But I also try to learn um, and try to understand that there are good officers out there. I do know that. I'm not foolish to think that there aren't. Um, but in these few cases, there hmm. are many cases where officers it seems like they, they go too hard. And in George Floyd's case, you don't, if someone is subdued, you don't need to go any further. And there's a, a laundry list of people where they either shot them numerous times or whatever. I think, I think an officer can disarm or disable someone and not kill them. There's four of them. There were four of them. There were four people. They were, and they he was were handcuffed. Blocking, um, they were blocking people. I think that uh, I understand police officers pr- protect one another, and I understand that they uh, they need to prevent crowds and whatnot, and that's what they say. But if you see a fellow police officer doing something to someone, you should say, "Hey, man, let let's let's rethink. Hey, chill out. Your 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 leg is on his neck. He's laying down. He's unconscious. Right. He's been there for nine minutes. It's uh it's tough to watch, and." It's, it's even harder to live as a black man knowing that this can happen. Um, a, a week prior, Ahmaud Arbery was running. He was on a jog in Georgia, and men chased him down and, and cornered him, videotaped it, and shot him three times with a shotgun because he was running yeah. in there. Um, this happens often, and it's so easy for someone to look the other way that's not necessarily – like, for example, for you, Russ, it's so easy for you to look the other way because you're not – really experiencing it or you can't empathize but when you say wait a minute what if this was me what if this was my brother my my children and they were chased down and shot or if they were on the ground with their head pinned into the cement i don't know how i you lose all your dignity when something like that happens how would you feel as a man if someone has their knee in your neck for nine for one second for right. nine minutes and it's under the color of the law it's an officer. It's a, a guardian of society. Uh, man, me as a father, I, it would be so stressful. I'm trying to put myself in your shoes. If you had a child, it would be so stressful for my son or my daughter to go to college or to walk around. I just got off the phone with Francesca. She's like, I'm going to jog right now. Do you think that I'm not aware that I'm black? while I'm just going jog. Like I, we don't think like that because we don't have to. So I'll, I'll, let me tell you something. I'm, I'm right now I'm in my apartment. I'm about to move into a house in a, a month, as soon as it's ready in a month or two. And what I like doing, I love plants. I love landscapes. I love all of that stuff. So what I like doing is I drive around neighborhoods and I take photos of beautiful landscapes because I've been working on the landscape of my house. But it petrifies me to drive slow around neighborhoods taking photos of landscapes. Mm. 
It petrifies. But like you look around my apartment, I have 70 plants in here. And you know, I'm I'm a designer. This is what I do, but I it's it's hard for me to just drive around these beautiful neighborhoods, dream about, you know, owning one of those houses one day, but also take photos because I'm like, man, they might think I'm casing the joint. They might call the cops. And then any interaction with the police is, is scary as a black man. I've had to call the police for myself on someone else in a road road rated road rage incident. A guy who was like, uh, he like spit on me from his car. And uh, we're still we're still in. Philip told me that happened to him. That exact who, same thing. Who did? Phil Philip. Yeah. Said that happened to him. A guy spit on me, and as a man, you're like, man, I want to fight wow. this. Wow. I got spit on in a car, so I turned. I turned. I made a Yui. I chased him, and I I took a photo of the back of his car. And I'm a pacifist. I don't believe in guns or anything like that. I don't know. I don't know much about guns, Russ, but. I took this photo and I said, you know what, exercising my better judgment, I'm going to call the police. I called the police. They told me to pull over and wait for the cops. And I waited. And as I was waiting for the cops, I was petrified. Right. And then as wow. I, when I Googled some of his, uh, his, his bumper plate stickers, I realized that they were gun brands. And he was probably so gung-ho about spitting on me because he probably had a gun. And, right. And, you know? That's exactly, yeah. So. Man. And it's it it goes it goes deep and it a lot of people delusional to the fact that I was too. Like for instance, the all lives matter thing, the black and blue flag thing. The reason that the reason that even exists is to almost slap you in the face, slap you in the face. Yeah. So it, that's the only reason it exists. Now a lot of people say no. They really mean it. Like my mom, she's an older lady. She would be like, yes, all lives matter. It makes sense. It makes sense. All lives matter. And I don't see how that doesn't make sense. But that's not why it was created. No. And the and the blue and black flag thing. I am for law enforcement. And earlier you said most of them are right. Most of them do the right thing. Well, in this case. There's four police officers there. In this case, 100% of the police officers there the were wrong. wrong. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say the number, the percentage of cops. Now, I'm just saying this straightforward. I know I'm going to get hate. I think it's worse than we even think. Russ, I think that it's, um, it's this. There's, a, there's, a, there's an issue with the system in that it creates this protectionism where if almost th they don't want to either correct someone if they're doing something wrong or tell on someone like out of those four people you might pull one you might see one they they might it's hard to say that they might be a good person but but because they protect each other it's almost like a gang mentality they're not going to go against that person while they're doing that thing no we're going to protect him and stand by him but Use independent thought and understand what he's doing is not right. And you can correct. I would think I can correct someone respectfully or or, or, yeah. or not respectfully. He's doing something totally wrong. Get Yo, chill out. Yo, get off his neck. Let's check him out. Yes. Make sure this guy's all right. Like tapping him. Hey, man. Hey, yeah. let up just a little bit. You got two other people on him right now. Yeah. He's, he's, he's screaming for his life. He's telling you you're killing him. Yeah. Yeah. It's, they're there and, and it's happened before. Like I was trying to I was trying yes, to No, this isn't the first time that we see this type of thing. It's not the first time we've we've heard I can't breathe and yep. seen someone killed like that. Man, I don't care what they say. No cops, none should ever be allowed to put their hands around your neck. If they have to tase you, then they should have they should have things in place, man, and that should be one of the no's. Yeah. Like you can't put your hands around someone's neck or your knee on their neck. This dude, dude, he the way he was and the guy that was talking, he sounded like he was uh he had no new MMA because he was on his artery where he couldn't breathe. He was like, Let you're on his spot where he this man can't breathe. And not only it looked like to me that when he was out. His body obviously was more relaxed. He wasn't tensed up anymore because he passed out. 
it looked like to me the officer even was more aggressive. Like, and he was like, look, you like that. You like what you're doing. Yeah. It's I think all four of these officers should be arrested. All of them. I, if I'm not mistaken, they've been fired. They need to be arrested. Fired. I mean, they need to be arrested. The one yeah. on his neck needs to be charged with murder. The rest of them needs to be charged with accessory to murder. For sure. I agree. And, and the thing is, this, we, it, I'm tired of it just fading away. It fades away. And then we don't hear about it no more. Then another one happens. Then another one happens. That's so it's the, getting to it's almost it's like get, desensitized to it, Russell. We get sentenced. This was, dude, this was, yeah, if you haven't seen the video, I would tell you to go watch it for just so you can understand the concept of what's happening here, how, why it affected me so much. Cause I promise you, if you're a human, it's going to affect you watching that video. Think if that is your child, if that, that is somebody's father. son right there. Somebody's father. Yeah. Maybe, I don't know about that, but still he, he, somebody loves that guy that has their knee on his neck. And that's their, his family members. That's the last image of him alive that they'll ever see. Begging for his life. And this isn't as, uh, an incident where it's just a, oh, this is a first time thing. This type of stuff just doesn't happen. It does happen. And we, and they, all this stuff that we're seeing people verbally attack other people. If that, if that gentleman went and had a camera and recording that and the cops would have showed up, he would have been arrested. He wouldn't have even been able to plead his case. He would have had to take it to court. And oh, then he had to spend tons of money in, in, uh, when the guy, the bird watcher. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh, if he would have been arrested, Russell, that's the thing. You have a lady screaming bloody murder, um, that, that, an African American. Why does she even? Ha why is she? Why is she saying? I'm gonna call the cops and say an African American man is attacking me. Why are you saying that? You know what you're doing. That's you know exactly what you're doing. And then she's choking her dog. Her dog's screaming for its life. And as she's on the phone, right, her voice gets louder. Oh my God, he's he's yeah. No, he's not doing yeah. Anything. She escalates it even more by by acting by playing it out as she's on the phone. Like, because, by the way, Wendell, in the court of law, they judge the tones and the voice of people that call 911. Like, that's in court. They bring that to court. And if someone brings that to court and she's like, oh, no, he attacked me. And here's the video. Here's the uh, 911 call. He could, no telling. Spend, you know, get probation or get spend a little time in jail or have it on his record. This is just a little example, though. Because this happens all the time. All the time. We're, and and you can say you can say it because you lived it. I haven't lived it. I don't have. I haven't seen it. And I think that's where the delusion comes with some of the white community. Because we haven't lived it, so it's harder for us to accept it. Because you know it's not it's not around us. We don't understand it. it. You don't. You don't. It's it's not. It's not your way of. It's not. You're you're not living living it. And sometimes it's hard to speak out about it. And this is what I've noticed. Um, I, I speak a, about being an ally and allyship. And it's, for me, it's if someone else, if uh, someone else is fighting their fight, if, if someone's fighting for gay rights or if, if women are fighting for women's rights or whatever, I am an ally because I understand. I think because I'm a black man, and I've been through so much, I can understand other communities going through it and I want to fight their fight with them or at the very least try to gain an understanding and help them in their cause and growing up through high school through college I've had lots of lots of white friends right my best of friends and for me to see incidents like this happen and for them to, not to speak out it affected me man like because for me if I see a, a black man hunted down and killed I'm like down and I'm depressed and I don't know how to react and I'm I'm sad and and I just for my best of friends who understand and can see me like this for them not to be allies it hurt me it hurt me for years Russell to the point where I didn't why do you think that happens though like even in your own community why does that why why do I think that 
why can't uh, a lot of your friends come together and say, no, we need to stop this? And here's what, here's what it was historically. They would send me text messages. Hey, I, I see you're going through it. I hope you're okay. Hey, I, I hope it's okay. But when they speak out against it, that's when I truly feel like I have an ally. And um, recently when Ahmaud Arbery was, was chased down and killed, shot with a shotgun, um, and people started using the hashtag run with Maude, uh, people would go on jobs and take a photo and use that hashtag because they're, you know, running to, to bring awareness to this issue and to what happened to him. My buddy Dom from Ghost Island, who, who mm -hmm. grew up in Long Island, he did it and he made a post on his Instagram about it. And he was saying that when he goes on a run, the only thing he's worried about is what he just ate because he might, you know, something might happen with his stomach. But yeah. I go on a run. Um, I have to worry about wearing bright clothes, running in the middle of the street and running in, not necessarily in the certain neighborhoods because of things that happen. And he right. made it and put it on his Instagram. And to me, I'd never seen any of my close friends do something like that. An outward act clearly stating that they're an ally for a cause that doesn't necessarily affect his um, community or his immediate com community. And that's what I think is needed. Like, Russell, I, I had no idea that you would come to me wanting to speak about this. And I didn't necessarily prep myself for this conversation, but when you hit me up an hour ago because you were a because you were touched by what happened, because you couldn't sleep this morning, because you woke up thinking about it. I was like, you know what? It's important that if, if Russell wants to be an ally, then let's make it happen. Um, if, if he wants to speak out against something that he sees and now can understand is wrong because he can empathize, let's talk about it. Let's, let's open the dialogue. It's about different people from different walks and different plights looking at something and understanding it's wrong and working together to find a solution. Right. Yeah, because we're Americans after all. And we, I'm watching all this stuff and it's on right now. And uh, they're protesting. I don't know how, if it's aggressive or not at this point, but I'm sure it is. But I see whites and blacks protesting. So I appreciate, I like that. I want to see that. Yeah. However they want to protest, I want to see it done together. And it needs to be, uh, we need to do it together as Americans because that's the only way that we're going to stop it. My kids, you know, uh, I'm going to have a whole new conversation with my children. I'm the one that's like, that's disrespectful, Michael. He's my son. You got to respect the, the United States and the national, national, the national anthem. I was completely delusional to the actual reason he's doing it. He's not doing it because he wants to disrespect anything with the military. It has nothing to do with it. it. It has everything to do with America, what's going on here. And yes, it's a wonderful country. Yes, we're, we're free. But uh, as you said, it's a free country where you worry when you go for a job now. Francesca, businesswoman, attorney, worries when she goes, runs uh, for a job. Philip, I talked to him not too long ago. Same thing. And, and every single time I, I ask the question, have you ever been affected? Every single time they say, I don't even know anyone that hasn't been directly affected, like strongly something has happened in their life. And that's where the white community gets it wrong because we're, we're not affected that way. And we don't see that type of things. We're not have to, we, I don't worry about, I can go for a job right now and run my butt. And it's night time, you know, nine o'clock at night. I'm in the country. You know, I got, I got rebel flags flying and all kind of stuff all over this neighborhood. This is redneck neighborhood in Texas. So I wouldn't worry at all. What if I was jogging around there? I would worry if you was, I wouldn't allow you to jog in the neighborhood. I would say, uh, man, it's best you just hang out. I'll jog with you or it's best you just hang out here. And that's crazy because now I'm just thinking that how, how, what I would tell you, hey, man, just hang out with me. And that's not that I know anybody racist around my neighborhood because I don't. 
but I do see some flags flying, some neighbors that I don't know. And it's just, uh, uh, it's just, I would want you to be safe. So I would say, no, it's best you don't. And that's crazy that I even say that because we're in America. We're not in Russia. We're not. Why, yeah, why shouldn't I be able to go on a jog and feel safe anywhere in the country? It's, it, it blows my mind even thinking like that right now. But yeah, you, it doesn't matter what neighborhood it is either. Would you be safe running in some wealthy, wealthy, super wealthy neighborhood? You, you know, they're going to think, oh, what's Dude. this bad guy doing? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, no, it's, and my nephews, I have five black nep- nephews and nieces. My soon-to-be son-in-law, my daughter, uh, she's having a baby. And I'm not sitting here saying, hey, uh, I got my I got some friends that's black and that stuff. My family is interracial. Everyone in my family, black, white, Spanish, it's all through the family. I was talking to my mom and she's like, what about Gavin? You know, when when that happens to Gavin and Gavin's um, my nephew, he's, he's black, my nephew, and he looks black. And if he, you know, this happens to him, they stop Gavin, they, they something bad can happen to him. So she's like, you know, this this kind of stuff's starting to worry me. Yeah. Because because uh, that's what they have. You know, it's to me it blows my mind. It's almost it, my mind is racing so much it's hard to even talk about. Because I'm trying to comprehend everything at one time, and it it just overwhelms me I how much hate they, they have. Yeah. It's, uh, and it's been overwhelming you all your life. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, that's why uh, I wear this shirt. I went to Morehouse college. It's a, it's a HBCU, a, a black college in, in um, Atlanta. And all my life, I, I grew up in white schools and I decided to go to a black college. And what that did for me, it's an all black, all male college. And for me to be in an environment like that, where there are only people that look like me that are all trying to get great grades and get in the, into the best grad schools and do well and be successful. It kind of, it kind of changed things for me. It made my perspective a little different because growing up in all white schools and neighborhoods, I, I can't say that I was, I was lifted up because of the imagery I, I've seen and because of those things. But when I got to Morehouse, it's like, you know what? Now, we're we're meant to be here and we're meant to do great things. So there's nothing yeah. inhibiting me from doing great things. And um, do you think that it translates um, that kind of attitude? Because I haven't seen this at all. But do you think it translates when when you're playing in a game of Survivor, like with the cast members, your cast, your first time you played, new ones? Do you see somehow that something? You felt a little weird sometimes. I, and I'm not saying, yeah. uh, you know, people don't like, oh, using the black card. He's using the black card and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm just talking real talk. Like, did you feel like that anytime? Because um, you're a good looking guy, man. You're the type <laughs> that you're the type that's like uh, some people would think, oh, he's a good looking black man. He's, he ain't having any issues or any problems. Yes. So I'm, I'm still a black man. Right. Fortunately, on Ghost Island, I will say that we had a very good, we had a good group, um, a group that I think, for the most part, judged you on what you have inside. And I was, I was lucky to have that. Um, Winners at War, another good group. But I noticed that when I started hanging around Jeremy Collins a little bit, that's that's when people that's all of a sudden I was the merge boot as soon as me and Jeremy got close. But you know you know why? I can tell you why from my perspective as a player too. Let's see. Because because you stick together, man. It's too close. It's too strong. Okay. That alliance is too strong because because you know it's like you can't you can't break that bond. He wrote my that name bond. Down. But you see what I'm saying? My side it wouldn't and I wouldn't have done it. Let's say. I would have 100%, I'm not just saying this to you, but 
you're the type of player I would have 100% aligned with. But if I'm not aligned with you and I see you hanging out with Jeremy all the time, I'm like, that's the type of bond that will take control of this game. It, now, that, that's questionable. And why it's, and it, you're saying that because it's two black men. No, two black people. That's no, why no, I'm, saying, I'm saying it because of the bond and the brotherhood that you have. All right, let me tell you. A quote As two black men. In the, in the brotherhood. It's all skin folk ain't kin folk. Right. Just because. Yeah, yeah, but we don't. Yeah, but that's, we know how tight it can be, though. Well, okay. It can be tight. Yeah, it can be tight. Um, but it also can't, like, Ghost Island, Des, Desiree went right for me. She gunned for me. It's not cut and dry that just because there happened to be two black players on the island, they will work together. Um, right. No, you're right. You're you right. Gotta, there, there's more to it. Jeremy and I are like-minded, and yes, we could have gotten some steam. We didn't even have a chance to work, to do anything. We had a chance to say hello. If I think it's, uh, I think it's very funny that the pair of Jeremy and Wendell was gunned for before a pair of Sarah Lucina and Tony Blockos. Who's a who's a stronger alliance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're right there, but I'm just saying. My perspective, if I'm just trying to win the game, trust me, when I'm in that game, I don't see anything but souls to take out. Yeah. I don't see, you know, so I'm like, I don't see my, my head is in the one direction. I'm a super aggressive player. Mm -hmm. But, and, and I would, I think, because as a viewer too, as a fan of the show, when I watched you two play, there was a few things that, and we'll get into this. We'll talk a little bit about Survivor. A lot, I think a lot of people interested about that since we talked about what we needed to talk about but i would as a as a fan i'm watching y'all and i'm like that's that's gonna work you know and am i saying it's gonna work because i'm like okay it's gonna work because it, it's not just because you're black it we have the, the we have the uh we're guys so sometimes guys work better together i fortunately work better with the girls so, so, and then I lose to them at the end of the, <laughs> at the, end of the day, but still, uh, there's certain types of personalities with guys that I could work with. I could work with you. I could work with Jeremy. I could work with Tyson. I couldn't work with Boston Rob. Could have never because he's, his, his, we're just not the same at all. Right. We're two di totally different people. Even though I'm an aggressive player, he's an aggressive player. I couldn't work with him, but if I seen you and Rob talking in the middle of nowhere, tell me if you think this would be racist in your mind. If I seen you and Rob talking, I'd be like, knowing Rob, knowing a little bit about you, I don't know your personality, I mean, your gameplay because I wasn't there, but knowing what they showed me, I'd be like, no way they're working together. No way. Ain't happening. And then I see you and Jeremy, knowing your gameplay, what I do know, we're talking together. Yes, they're working together. For sure. That's what I would think. And is it wrong that I'm thinking it because you happen to be two uh, black gentlemen? Or, you see what I'm saying? It's, Do you think it's, it's me just seeing that because you're two, two black gentlemen? I mean, you're still stereotyping. You're still yeah, but I'm, I'm stereotyping it as I grew up as an athlete all my life. That's all I hung around. Uh -huh. And uh, I know the bond, and you're right, you don't always have that bond. But I, I wouldn't be looking at it as a stereotype. It, I guess it, it seems that way, but I would be like, okay, they are together because of the brotherhood. Would yeah, I be but, right, though? I would have been right, though, right? Yeah, but, but yeah, so, sometimes stereotypes are, are right, yeah. Do you know how tight the Jewish community is? Yes. There were multiple Jewish folks on the island. Right. One might argue that they're tighter than the black community. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I mean, I see your point, but am I right that you would have worked with Boston Rob? You're wrong in that because you thought I wouldn't work with Boston Rob. Yes, I, I, I think, and I'm thinking as your game play and what I've seen of it. If I got to hang, see, when I hung out on the edge with Boston Rob, I learned a lot about him. If I just hit the beach with him, I'd want him off the island. 
if if he got some time yes. if if he got some time and I was able to feel him out, then I think I could work with him. See what okay. I'm saying? I don't yeah, no, to- I no, I I get it cuz when it, when we hit the beat together, I was like I can't work with this cat. No way. Yeah. But it, but then Tyson spent and it always it always I was like how is that even happening? Tyson would actually work with Rob. That's because they spent time together. But that happened with Lex too. Lex spent time with him before the game and he got burnt, but that's a totally different story. So when I was this is this happened in the game when Jeremy did not work with his alliance or try to fight for his alliance and ultimately you go home when he walks away you say he just walked away he just walked away from his his alliance like what was going through your mind were you and here's where it comes back to the the tight brotherhood and, and just hear me out so now he walks away so do you get upset because um he didn't work with you. He didn't fight for you. And now he's doing it again. Now he's just walking away again. He's not fighting again. And he's walking away for, from what he has. That's not why I got upset. See, I was wondering about how I'll, why you said what you said. I'll try to briefly explain it to you. Um, basically, when I was in the game, after that, uh, the challenge, you have to hold on to those like telephone poles. And if you fall down, you can break something. You know, that was the merge challenge uh for immunity and he won it and we got on the boat and we went back to the island when we got off the boat we're still on lockdown him and i got off last he was like yo you're good you're good you're good he whispered it to me so i'm thinking because we're on lockdown this is kind of outside the game he's he my bro is saying i'm good and have a relationship with him outside the game so i'm like a friend of mine just told me i'm good so i'm cool fast forward he learns that I'm not good and he doesn't share that information with me. Now, I, I watched the show and I saw he did fight for me to some degree. So I thank him for that. But at the end of the day, he didn't give me the opportunity to fight for myself. So I got mm-hmm. booked out and I was pissed. As people came, I started learning that he did fight for me. But at the point when he, okay. walked, when he walked away, I was still pissed at him. So I'm oh, like, I see. And, and Russell, there was a point in the game when I was like, Tony is running circles around these people. He's owning everything. Did the you person, see that when you were there? When you were there, he was doing? When I, not, not when I was playing. When I was on the edge, listening to what's happening um, during Tribal Council, he, we were just like, whoa, Tony is, Tony is running this show. Why aren't these people gunning for him? And in my head, I'm like, yo, Jeremy's that guy. He better, he better shoot his shot. And then for him to walk out on his alliance, I thought he was some words that I'm not going to use on your podcast. But right. I, I was like, yo, this guy is not who I, he, he's not, he's not what, what I thought he was. And granted. Yeah, Cause that was an opportunity for him to take control by making some big move. Yeah. But I mean, he was protecting himself. I get it. But um, I, that's where my head was at that point. I was mad at him for voting me out and making me feel comfortable. And, um, yeah, I was just like, man, he's a little chump. Yeah. So, so with Tony, I wasn't sure if he laid low. Did he lay low? Like he said he was going to lay low or did you see him playing like pretty fast early in the game? He laid so low, you know, I build things. I'm building the shelter. He's right there next to me. I'm looking at him. There was one time I was like, I know you, Everyone was gone. It was me and Tony. And I said something like, yo, I know you want to dip out right now. He's like, nah, man, I'm building the shelter with you. I was like, all right, cool. Um, <laughs> that sounds like him, man. <laughs> yeah, this is crazy, man. I'm going to talk about <laughs> So I never do impressions. I don't know how. Anyway, so, but there was one time, I think it was when we voted out Tyson. We saw old Tony, and that was early. That was on the call, when, like a couple votes in when we had to vote out someone. Tony started running circles around the island and doing all and causing chaos. And I was like, man, we saw old Tony for a minute. And then fast forward, he turned it on the second half of the game. He, he was smart. He laid low. Right. He awesome. That's good. So the poverty thing, man, would you have, would you have made that deal? No. 
So if she would have gave you that right there, you'd have just voted her out. Yeah. Was there, is there any, and I knew that, I knew that that was like, he's trying to, you know, that's a good move for you to just vote her out at that point it's too late. Yeah. But could she have did anything? You watching the show, you watching it back. The, she had, I keep saying, man, she had all these tools to work with. Do you think she would have got Nick could have got Nick or even uh, you? She was hiding all her tools. That's the thing. She had many bargaining tools that I, I didn't know about the, the nullifier. I don't think people knew about it. Like, Use these to negotiate, even if it's to vote me out. Like, talk to Nick, yeah. who's fangirling over you and is in love with you. Negotiate with something. She could have done it. Um, the thing, the thing with me and Parv, I want to get this out first because it, 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 the way it appeared was, oh, Wendell's just a jerk. He's not working with her. When we got to the island, and I think I said it in confessionals. I was like, nah. She called. She said that Russell Hans was her pet. I said something like that during a, a confessional. She they, said I was her pet. In, no, in back in here. She probably Club. did. In, in right. She was my pet, really, though. Uh, bro, I know. bro, I'm I'm gonna try to be kind to Parv, but right. But anyway, so when we got on the island, um, I we went to the water, and I'm like, cool. I finally get to meet Parv. Let's work. I tell her everything that happened on the call. Who's working with who? Why people got voted out? Who I would still work with? I gave her all the breakdowns. I'm like, so what's up? Tell me about selling. She's like, I would work with and named everyone on the on the former Selly tribe. She didn't give me anything. I just worked with these people. So I'm like, oh, I get it. She has. She, she's gonna if if we go to tribal, I'm gonna be the mark. She's gonna go gun for me. She's not working with me from the moment we got on the beach. So. And then on the island, I had an alliance with Michelle, with Nick, mm -hmm. and with Yule. These are my people. And right. they would always tell me that part, my name's in her mouth. She's telling me, she's calling me aggressive. And she's saying all these things about me. And I'm the guy that she voted out and blah, blah, blah. So I know she's gunning for me. So I'm just like, you know what? I'll keep it real with you. Um, and then we, we lose and we have to go to tribal. Before tribal, she comes to me in the ninth hour like, hey, Wendell, is there anything we could do? Can we work? Right, like, like probably an hour before tribal. Wow. Maybe that's, like, how, that's what she does too. So wait like, the last second. I'm like, all right, uh, yeah, two. Give me two fire tokens, and and I'll vote with you. I said it to her because I knew she. There was no chance she was, she was going to write my name down, and I knew she was just bluffing. So then, um, she's like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm like, Parv, I'm still, I'm a big fan of yours, but it looks like you're writing my name down. I'm probably writing your name down. I am being real with you. I hope you ex I hope you respect someone that's being real with you because everyone else that she thought she was working with, Michelle, Yule, Nick, they were telling me everything. So right. I, I was the only one keeping it real with her. And so from that, from my perspective, I, I, I reckon I respect someone that keeps it real. And through through tribal, you know, I continue to tell her like, and yeah, Pro said, is that a current offer? And I said, yeah, part of, you know, give me a name. And even at that point, when she could have tried to shake things up or whisper to me, she didn't get up. So. Yeah, no, I thought she was going to work with Nick. Like she had somebody, what she does, the way she plays is she flirts. That's how she plays. It's in her game. And she gets oh, respect yes. for it. So it's oh, okay. In your face and stuff. Yeah. Yes, she, right. Yes. Super, super charming. It works for her. For sure. So so I'm wondering why isn't she pushing that hip, hip out for Nick and saying, hey, I'll give you three fire tokens. When, well, or with um, she had who she had working with Michelle. her at that time. Oh, so Michelle was with you, though. But I mean, according to the, the narrative that the show. Yeah, that's another, another thing, man. The, and it's not only the narrative to the show with Michelle. It's what she was saying behind the scenes. Like, did it shock you to hear some of the things that she was saying? Yeah. So, you know, it would be a stupid move for me to me and Michelle to go out with a, our past. And not be ready. Yeah. So yeah. we were like, yo, and we're both dating people at the time. We we're like, yo, when we go out here, let's create distance. That was the plan. Okay. She, but she did it literally, man. She, bro, she did it for she, us, too. <laughs> to the nth degree, bro. She went hard with it. All I did was like, you know, 
Uh, I try, I try to stay away. So, man, so what editing did, so editing was able to put you uh, doing what you were supposed to do strategically with her that y'all already talked about, and then put her talking about it on camera, put it all together, and, and then it makes you, then you're the new villain in the book. Yeah. Welcome, welcome to the villain club. Me. If they do heroes versus villains too, yeah. I got your back. I'll see you. And I'll fight for you. Got you. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that, yeah, so, so I, I will say. Um, that was super confusing to me, man. As I'm trying to talk about the show, as I played the show, I'm like, I'm thinking, man, they have to have some sort of alliance. But why is Michelle saying these things? So now I'm thinking, maybe they don't have this alliance. Maybe this isn't going. So you're acting for everybody around you. And she's, ta she, she's taking it. She did a good job, though. Yeah. So, yeah. And she's she's telling everyone how Wendell's arrogant and cocky and all this stuff. And I saying you burnt her. I was like, what? Yeah. yeah that that sh that was shocking. Yeah, that was shocking. Um, and because literally, we talked Dude. the day before we flew out. We talked in casting. We planned. We talked. Yeah, like, of course. Yes. Every week. Dude, the world that was watching this show, the 10 million people were like, man, he's a butthole. Like he burned her and she's in the back saying, what he did to me, I'm getting him back. And then, and then when she, wait, when you got voted out, I looked at, I was watching her face and she was super upset. So then I'm thinking something's up here. Like she, like they had, they had to have something going on. Dude, when when I went home, she was upset. She, uh, I was, I didn't know. I was, I was so blindsided. I left my sneakers. I left my headband at the camp. Apparently, Ben took my headband and he was trying to do something with it. And she like got in a fight with him. Like, no, he's my friend. That's I'm gonna get it to him. Um, she gave it to me after the game. When remember, remember, um, in the finale when I was, we were in the fight back challenge, and I almost won it. Um, I was like beating everyone to like, you know, through the whatever and to the ball thing. I sunk a ball like before anyone got there. When I lost, she started bawling, crying. Oh, yeah. Ball, it didn't, they didn't, of course they didn't show that. I looked over, she started bawling. So, yeah. like we had, we had a, re, a relate, like that was my friend. Um, we hung out a lot. That was my friend. Like after we dated, we were friends. And yeah. now, like, did I she? Oh, no. Y'all not really friends anymore? Or? I just, I mean, I mean, I, did, is I, it because of what she, you think she's just ashamed of how they edited it? And all of a sudden you're a big time villain? Is it, is she, you think no, she's just upset because of that? No, she, I think she's upset. Um, I, I do think I think she's I think she's hurt the way they edited me because I took a lot of backlash. I yeah. Like, I don't want to I, I don't want to keep belaboring this, but man, like no, you know, I, I hear you. No, I, I, do you yeah. know who you talking to? Oh yeah, true. true, true. I don't. Yeah. Do they? I, I have hate. I have hate that's still on fire. Like I ran over their puppy dog. Yeah. Still today, like people hate me with a passion. Right. But Russell, you are a good villain. Right. You, it's like almost. It's like you wear it with pride. I yeah. I never considered myself a villain. Right. I considered myself like someone that does the right thing and, and plays the right game and all that stuff. No, I'm not. I'm, no, I'm not saying you don't play the right game. Just someone that. No, I see what you're saying. You see what no, I'm saying. I hear what you're saying. And you're... I, I walked away not even expecting any kind of a villain at it. And then when you were watching it, man, because they went all out, they went all out on it. They went. Like they all worked out. it, and they, they you are one hundred percent now on the villain squad for sure. And, right. and so I had to lean in during the season. I had to lean into it and act. Like you did. I seen you leaning into it with some of your tweets and stuff you said. Because what else can I? Can I? Should I? Should I hide from Twitter and and and? No. You 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 take it. You take the punches, you keep moving forward. 
and, and you're going to have hate no matter what. People hate all of the cast members, every single one. But the villains, us villains, we get, we get a lot of hate. And the way they spin it, man, I was like, well, looks like to me that uh, Wendell, Burnt, Wendell uh, Burnt Michelle, she's upset. And now she wants, it, wants him gone. And then <laughs> it was. And then did know, you man. vote me out? Was she a part of the no. vote? No. Nope. Vote me out? She no. was actually upset when you got voted out that she wasn't part of it. Was that? Yeah. She was, she, upset. She was upset. Yeah. I mean, that's good. Yeah, so, you know, if your ally goes and you're left out, like, why'd you leave me out? I would have voted for them too. You got to say that. So, are you okay being a villain? Yeah, I'm fine with it. Because, look, they're going to do a Heroes versus Villains too, 100%. One day they will do it. And if they do it, man, we, that would mean we working together. That's all that means. Man, I'm a little, <laughs> man, if if I'm on that island, of course I'm working with you, but I'm a little survivor out right now, man. I'm like. Oh, no, I get you, man. Trust me. I played, <laughs> can you imagine this? I played three times in a year and a half. A year and a half. I can't imagine. I was so, my mind was so mush and gone. I lost my marriage. I lost my, my business. Yeah. I mean, it was, that's why when I hear that Jeff saying something about a 16 year old season and teenagers and stuff like that, I'm like, don't let that happen. Cause we grown men have trouble with it. Grown women have trouble with it. You don't think some child is going to have trouble with this game. I call a lot of uh, the cast members. I'm not going to say any names. We talk on the phone and they just not want to do any interviews right now. They don't want to do it. They want it to be gone from their, their mind, especially in an aggressive, aggressive season like, like a uh, winners at war. It's, would you say that this was a lot harder than the first time you played? Yes, it was a lot harder. Um, everyone was out there for blood. It was definitely um, all business and it was more complica- complicated because my first season, no one knew each other. Everyone had a clean slate. You can create whatever narrative about yourself. Um, you don't know these people, and it's truly about how you immerse yourself into this group of people. In yeah. winter four, we have um, a married couple. We have someone that used to date someone in that married couple. We have people that played together. We have multiple villains. We have people that dated. We have people that you know hate each other, people that... We have all these people, people that played together 15 years ago. You have all these relationships. Um, you don't know who is really working with who, who pre-gamed with who. And then you have the old the old guard who coincidentally was voted out kind of first, the first 10 people or whatever, the, um, the old school people. And there was no alliance saying gun for the old school people i i've seen that on reddit and other places maybe not reddit but i've seen it like oh all the new schoolers had an agenda that they were going to get out of the old schoolers no it literally just happened that way um, right and also you think of the old schoolers that are there it's like no i don't want to go far in a game with boston rob and parv and it's right. right i get people, it if i sit next to them at the end who am i kidding i'd be a stupid right. So, um, yeah, it was about there, – there, it, was, it was crazy. It was a, a mind game just thinking who would work with who, who's working with who. Sarah and Tony, they did a great job of not letting it be really known how tight they were, even though you would assume that they're super tight. But right. they did a good job of distancing themselves. I think I might have even said something to Sarah like, yeah, I'm staying around the shelter to babysit Tony or something like that. Early wow. in the game, but then again, they became allies with me early in the game, also, and then they yeah. slit my throat. But um, yeah, they did a great job of distancing themselves, and that's, I guess, ultimately what really helped them down the line to the point where they could just let it be known that they're working together, and no one can can take any shots at. Them. Yeah. So, would you have been okay if Natalie or Michelle would have won the game? I would have been okay if Michelle won the game. Okay. Uh, for a couple of So you wouldn't have been okay with Natalie with one? No. Because they edited it pretty cool. They oh. edited it where it looked like, oh, well, she might get some votes here. Of course, 
they 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 made they made Natalie and Michelle look pretty strong down the line because right. they, they but from my perspective on the edge, Tony was a head and shoulders above the pack for a while. At least maybe like the top eight or seven votes. It was just clear if this guy sits next to anyone at the end, it's a wrap. And yeah. um, it, from, from Michelle's standpoint and Natalie's, from Natalie's standpoint, there were some things that she did on the edge that really turned people off. And made yeah, that, that's another thing I wanted to talk about. Cause, cause Rob says uh, that he, she separated herself from a lot of people on the edge. Uh, she, y'all knew that you were going to get a part of the vote, right? I mean, why would you separate yourself when you cater into the the ones that's about to vote and you think you may be getting in the game? Like, what did she do to separate herself? Okay, um, she. There was one point when I think um, when when Adam got to the edge, Yule went on a walk with him, and well, they went on a walk to get rice, which is like, thank you guys for scaling this mountain to get this rice for us. But Yule right. is a talker, man. And he's a, he's like a sweetheart. He's a great, he's a great soul. And I think he stayed up there. I think him and Adam sat for maybe like 40 minutes, an hour even, sat up there just talking. Cause Yule can do that. And Adam literally just got voted out maybe a night or two before. So Yule was there for him. When they get back down with the rice, I think it was at, at the rice, or it might've been when Yule was out like fishing too long or something. Now he just went in on him like yelling at him and that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. But also like I was cool with Natalie when I first got there, she, she talked to me and things, but then later down the line, I guess when, I don't know why it happened, but she stopped talking to me and, Oh, there was another point. Oh, there's, there's too many stories. There was one <laughs> point when we, uh, we got a note for like one, one of those challenges on the edge. And I was the first off. I was running. I ran up the mountain instead of running around. And I was like, I was ahead of everyone. I thought I was going to find it. But Natalie ran around because she knew that the throne that was referred to in the scroll was around the mountain. She got this advantage where you can send something into the game. They said you can write down to blank from blank on the parchment. This wasn't shown. And... So you can write it's from anybody to anybody. So oh, okay. she was like, oh, I'm going to write to Nick from Wendell because Nick is Wendell's buddy and Nick will do anything to get to get this. Um, so I was like, oh, Natalie, wow. yeah, I was like, Natalie, if you're and, and this was when they were asking for astronomical numbers of fire tokens, like eight tokens. Right. Or six. Yeah. I was like, Natalie, OK, I understand the, the thought process, but I I'd, I'd prefer you to give me like two of the fire tokens if you're getting eight fire tokens for that to use my name then i think her and kim came up to me like no she's not going to use your name no big deal i'm like all right cool so then fast forward to that tribal council and apparently nick gets an advantage from the edge and uses it against maybe ben or something like that and nick is like yeah i got an advantage from my buddy wendell da, da, da. and i'm sitting there like oh. wow so then I think, yeah, so that rubbed But people. why did she have to, why did they, they have to show, did she have to show you guys? Could she have did that privately, like in a strategic way? Oh, I, I mean, she, yeah, so so she didn't have to, so clearly I didn't know until Nick said it that she wrote my name on it. Uh, and this, I, this is as I remember it, I might be a little cloudy, but I, what I believe was I was telling her like, yo, I want to I wanna watch you write something down because I think that you're going to use my name. And then a producer was like, Wendell, not, she has to go on a walk with me and she's going to write whatever. And then when she came back, her and or Kim both were like, no, she didn't write your name now. That kind of turned me off to both of them. And wow. with, with Natalie, I'm just like, all right, she's kind of a snake and that's cool. She's been hiding peanut butter and all these things from me and other people, Yule and Adam. So you can't get my vote. You didn't, if you have, if you literally have the jury right next to you for weeks, you are able to jury tamper. You can tamper yes. with the jury as long as you yes. want. Literally, do whatever you need to do to make us vote for you. There was a blueprint. Chris Underwood did it a couple seasons before. Yes. You could do it. You, you be nice to the jurors, and then you get back in the game, and there's one other thing you need to do. 
right. Go to Could... fire and beat Tony at fire making. Right. And, and that's yep. that's the way there's a there's a blueprint out there. That's the way you win. Or so if she beats Tony, if she take if she sits there and she says, you know what, Jeff, and she takes that necklace off and she sits it at her feet and she's like, I'm going against him. Cause because he's the best player in this game. And I know that there's no shot for me unless I take him out myself. Does she win? Then it would be her, Sarah Lucina, and Michelle. Yeah. Um, it would be. It would be very. It would be close all three ways. Oh really? Michelle would have at least maybe like four votes. Sarah Lucina would have like Ben, Tony, Denise. Yeah, it would be close. Uh, Natalie might win because because at that point, um, you know, Tyson and Parv and. Who do you vote for with that with that outcome? Michelle. Yeah, OK. I, OK. So, do, so even, some of people did not want to vote for Natalie, did not want that outcome because she was she was the first off. OK, so first and foremost, I. I can't see an, uh, someone from the edge winning season 40 winners at war because they were voted off. When you have people that played strong games that didn't have to rely on getting voted out. First of all, that's my stance. I, as a player, sure. Give me as many chances to get back in the game as possible as a player, as a purist and as a fan. Nah, if there are people sitting at the end and people didn't get voted out, but they still played a strong game then I'm definitely leaning towards them for the win. Um, but also, if, if yeah, I'm, I'm probably voting for Michelle over, over Natalie and maybe even Sarah because of how strong of a survival player Sarah is. I truly believe she's a very strong survival player. Yeah. So, that would have well, been interesting. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Um, and I think it's very pertinent. When I was on the call 1.0, there was a time when Nick said something, Nick, as who used to be a public defender, said something to Sarah Lucina, a police officer. He's like, man, cops are crooked. Cops are this, cops are that. And I'm sitting there like, man, I don't want to talk politics, race. Right, um, right. No, I, I understand that. I don't when you're out there. Yeah. I, I know I'm, I'm one of the two black men on this cast. I don't want to touch any of the hot button topics on Survivor. That's not a winning strategy. I try to play to win. So right. when Nick said that, I was like, whoa, I was taken aback. But at the same time, I thought, man, I've been building this bond with Sarah Lucina, and maybe this is an opportunity, if nothing else, to shed some light on something on the national um, on the national stage. So I went down, I was like cleaning dishes. I was doing something by the water, and Sarah came to join me. And I said to her, I was like, Sarah, this might seem controversial or something, but I want to talk to you about my experience as a black man with police officers. And then because I listened to her, how she was talking about officers, when Nick said that officers are crooked and this and that and the third, Sarah was talking about her specific police district and how they get, if they use profanity, they get like in trouble. If they run a red light, they get in trouble. It's apparently it's very to the book, but right. I think it's because like, there might not be a lot of minorities where she's from or something. I don't know what it is. Right. It's very utopian over there, I guess. Whereas in Philadelphia or in these big cities, it's, we see a lot and we experience a lot. So right. I did aggressively say it. I said it like, hey, hey, this is my experience. If all police officers were like you and those from your district, it would be great. But this is, from my perspective, what I see. And... I, they didn't show any of that. Maybe it was because it was Bill and Edit Wendell time or whatever, but I just find it so pertinent and it would have been such such a great thing to to show. But then again, I understand like whenever they touch hot button topics, sometimes it turns off a lot of people and people go watch Survivor to, to, to have an outlet and to just laugh and see cool characters and not necessarily see a microcosm of America, but... I think that certain topics should be touched sometimes. Yes, for sure. There's some that you need to stay away from. Like you just said, it's like, especially as a player, 
Like when I'm out there, I, oh no, I'm I'm not even independent. I'm like I'm nothing. Yeah, I'm I'm you know I'm just trying to play. Like I said, I see souls to take. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's all I that's all I want. <laughs> I like it, man. I, it's smart. It's not smart. It's not good survivor play to t- to touch on certain topics like that. It's not. No. So uh, overall, man, do you think the reason I'm getting a lot of people say let's do the talk, but later it's because it was such an aggressive mental season? Oh yeah. I, I like. I am survivored out. I like Well if they called you tomorrow and say we want you to play another season in a month from now, could no, you do it? No. You wouldn't do it. Nope. Russ, I there were opportunities that I don't want to talk about that I did turn yeah. down for Survivor 40 and look look how they did me. So I'm I'm ta- I'm taking a little breather and I'm pursuing other things. Um but like, yeah, it, it, it's tough, but I'm not the person that will stand down. And like, for example, Bryce called me for his podcast and I know we were going to talk about race and survivor and other things. And I yeah. find it important to speak about these things because there are people that will follow in my footsteps. And so when you text, I, of course, I want to talk to you about survivor because you're Russell Hans. But mm-hmm. when you texted me earlier and said, nah, we need to talk about certain issues in the country right can't down from that like there are too many people that i can help or that i can change or that you and i standing and, together can and the change. thing is you know i hope that you know it's hard for me to word it i'm sure some people are going to get upset by this by some of the ways i worded some things i'm just not good at talking about that kind of stuff it's not what i do this is a podcast about reality tv so if I did something to offend somebody and said something that uh, it wasn't to offend anybody, I thought that it's a subject that we needed to talk about at the beginning of this podcast. But we got into Survivor, and I'm glad we did. But, you know, I don't know if I said anything to you that offended you. I'm just talking. Uh, okay. I called Dom before this podcast, and I'm like, yo, Russell wants to talk to me about race, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And he, he said, look, Wendell. If, if he happens to say something that offends you or whatever, right. I, I know how, like, Russell, right now, you are opening your mind to things. So right. I'm not scared of you saying something that will offend me. I am impressed and proud that you're willing to try to have a conversation with someone completely different and try to just open your mind a little bit. Right. So, I appreciate that, too. And that's exactly what we all need to do. If more people would be opening their mind to the subject, and actually understanding it, yes, it's hard for me to talk about some f- stuff like that because I, I, you know, like I said, I'm, this isn't a political uh, podcast, right. and we don't talk about it. I just felt it was it touched me the whole thing, and uh, like none a- ever did. And I wanted to bring it out. And I wanted to talk to you about it because I seen you tweeting some things about it, uh, and then I, you know, I thought it needed to be said. But saying that, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm doing, man talking about that <laughs> i mean okay. i probably have no business i have somebody working with me that works uh on the back end of the podcast and i'm t- i'm talking to her and i'm texting her i'm like should i even do this i mean i don't i don't know if i should even do this because i know nothing about this right here's here here's the thing and also the people that listen to you probably it, it, you're you're gonna you might change some folks opinions you might not um some people might not like the things that you're saying you're you're sticking your neck out for this to to speak about this topic it's yes i am impressed by and i know i could lose viewers and i've seen some comments people oh what are they talking about i'm out of here that kind of thing i know i can lose subscription subscribers and viewers but i think it's more important than that and i am uh you know i thought that it was necessary it's a cover. I, I appreciate the conversation. I mean, you're still going to be Russell Hans with the Russell Hans podcast talking about all things, but for, for you to divert one time and try to, you know, see something different. I think I, I'm impressed. Yeah. So what did Dom tell you? He was like, Oh no, man, watch out. We don't know what he's going to say. <laughs> he said, he said, uh, I want to be exact with what he said. 
um, he said, he said, you know what you're doing. And he said, it's talking about me. And obviously, mm -hmm. he said, right. I know what I'm doing. And despite basically what we just said, even if mm -hmm. you say something that might offend me or whatever, I, I'm more so, I remember during apartheid, I, I don't, I, during apartheid in South Africa, there was a thing called the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And what they did was they said the war criminals come forward and tell your truth and there will be some kind of reconciliation. We won't, you know, there will be a way to, we, we want to clear the air. We want to get things out there so people can come to peace with things. So if I'm not calling you a war criminal or any of these things, but I'm saying the more dialogue that exists, the more that you speak, even if it makes you uncomfortable, even if you're saying something that you think uh, might not necessarily be politically correct, I'm a sounding board and I can either say how I feel about it. At least our feelings are getting out there. At least we're speaking about it. Right. As opposed yeah. to running to our own communities and speaking of yes. pointing. Right. This is how I think things it's super important. Yeah. Yes. I'm glad we talked about it, man. And I sure appreciate you coming on the show. It's been an hour and 11 minutes. I know that it's a, uh, I've been there. I know it's, it's your mind is like mush when you talk yeah. about survivor, but I can see also the passion in you with the game and how you get into it. That's, I appreciate that type of thing because I have passion towards the game. Maybe one day down the road, four or five years from now, we may meet on an island one night or one day. You never know. If that yeah. happens, it's going to be fun. You know, if you're but, on the island, he's going to say, I heard on Russell's podcast, he made an alliance. <laughs> and then they're going to shut, they're going to replay it. They're going <laughs> to play it on the screen. They're going to be like, oh, Ru Russell said he'll work with, uh, with Wendell. Oh, no. Yeah, but thank you so much. But, uh, anytime, man. Mule must have did his homework, you know, started looking at all the podcasts, all the stuff. Because I write down, I have a little book. I have a little book and I'm like, okay, so and so said this and said this. Gotta be careful now these days. You gotta be careful. <laughs> yeah. All right, brother. Well, Thank you very I appreciate much. you, man, coming on the show. Uh, I think it was a good conversation. Even the survivor stuff, we we touched on everything I wanted to hear about. And I appreciate you guys uh, staying in here, listening to it. You know, again, I'm not a political speaker. I don't do that type of thing. This is a reality TV podcast. I just want to have fun. And I know that wasn't fun, the first part of it, but it's something that needed to be said. And I appreciate Wendell for coming on here because it's hard for, for, you know, it's hard for me to get someone that actually wanted to talk about stuff like that because I had a few people said, no, we, we don't want to do that. And I appreciate you fighting for that kind of, that kind of cause. Thank you. All right, man. Well, um, uh, Appreciate it again. And like I keep saying, like Michelle said, keep hope alive. Keep hope alive, my man. Thank you so much. <laughs> Good to wrap.